So today's topic is about supported decision making and um, supported decision making. Th this all came about uh, from a pilot project that was funded by the Arizona Developmental Disabilities Planning Council. Um, so the partners on this grant or, or, or on this project is the ARC of Arizona, the Southwest Institute for Families, and the Arizona Center for Disability Law. Your presenters today are John Myers, me, Sai In, and Juliana Horenya. And I am going to kick things off. Um, and, and to kick things off, I'm going to start talking about um, guardianship because to fully understand supported decision making, you, uh, it's important to understand like where it's coming from and, and the framework that it involves. So I'm, I'm going to start off with talking about guardianship. And then we're going to move on to supported decision making. And at the end, we're going to um, leave it. Um, we're going to leave like a, a couple of minutes at the end for some Q and A. So, what is guardianship? Um, before I go into that, I am going to share with you this quote from Claude Pepper. Claude Pepper is a former U.S. senator. He did a lot of work advocating on behalf of individuals um, with disabilities, but mainly, um, mainly with the aging population. He said, the typical ward has fewer rights than the typical convicted felon. By appointing a guardian, the court entrusts to someone else the power to choose where they will live, what medical treatment they will get, and in rare cases when they will die. It is in one short sentence, the most punitive civil penalty that can be levied against an American citizen. So that's a pretty profound quote and it, and it, it just really underscores how big of a deal guardianship is. And it also underscores the need to consider other alternatives before choosing guardianship. Now, I'm also going to say um, to, we're not here to attack guardianship because guardianship does play a very important role in our society. Uh, we're just here to provide information on alternatives um, should, should an individual be suit, suited for um, any other alternatives. So what is guardianship? In my section, I'm going to talk about some legal definitions on obligations. I'm going to talk about individual rights. I'm going to go over testamentary and um, guardianship by petition. Uh, I'm going to go over who can be appointed guardian and the various steps to becoming a guardian. Um, I'm also going to discuss limited guardianship too as an alternative to guardianship. So guardianship is a legal process and, um, and it depends on the jurisdiction. So I, I, I put that there because um, guardianship is, it, it, it depends on where you're at and where the individual, well, mainly where the individual who is subject to guardianship is at. So, um, so it could depend on certain tribal laws. If, if you're on a tribe or a tribal nation, and the individual is there, um, that tribe can have specific laws um, pertaining to guardianship, or it could, or if you're on, or, or if you're not on a tribe and you're within the state of Arizona, um, the, the Arizona's laws can apply to. I'm going to go over a, a little more later about what that means, but um, just know that it really all depends on the jurisdiction and you really need to know what jurisdiction you are to understand like what rules may apply. Um, so a guardian is someone who is uh, who is appointed by a court, usually a probate court judge, to care for another individual. Um, so that the guardian will become the decision maker for the incapacitated individual. And um, so the guardian will make decisions based on 
like where to live, um, what programming to do, and, and things like that, and incapacitated. So here's the Arizona state statute definition of incapacitated. So incapacitated means a person who is impaired by reason of mental illness, deficiency, disorder, physical illness, physical disability, chronic drug use, or someone who lacks sufficient understanding or capacity to make or communicate responsible decisions concerning themselves. So what that last part means is that the individual who could be subject to guardianship uh, does not have sufficient understanding to make or communicate decisions. It, it, it's, it's, it's a court determination and it depends on a lot of evidence. Um, so it, it's, ne it's never cut. Uh, it's never cut and dry, so it, it, it depends on a lot of evidence. So what's at stake here? A lot is at stake because when, when like referencing that, uh, that quote from Claude Pepper, um, you're essentially, or the court is essentially taking away the right to uh, make decisions and vesting it in someone else. So that's, that, that, that can be like a, a lot of responsibility. Um, so here are some of the duties of a guardian, um, the general health care of the individual, training and education where it's appropriate, uh, clothing, furniture, uh, managing vehicles and other personal effects, uh, receiving money if, it, if that individual is entitled to it, um, finding the least restrictive um, setting for the individual, so it could be like a community-based setting, uh, a group home, um, seeking services that are in the best interests of the in individual. So a guardian has the duty to, to act within the best interests of the individual at all times. And here are some individual rights that are at play. So the right to vote. So as we saw in the last election, um, many Americans uh, exercise such a very fundamental, important right to vote. So with guardianship, that, that right can be potentially taken away. Um, making health care decisions, um, finding education or training, consenting to marriage, and uh, making financial decisions. Who is appointed guardian? So here's what Arizona law says, and it could be different um, based on the jurisdiction or based on the tribe, but here um, in Arizona, um, there is a certain hierarchy and it usually starts off with someone who is already appointed a guardian for another individual in the same county as, as, the, um, as the individual who is subject to guardianship someone nominated by the individual, um, the individual's power of attorney, uh, the individual spouse. So that general, generally comes up with individuals who have age-related disabilities like uh, dementia or Alzheimer's, um, the child, an adult child of the individual, and uh, any other relative for whom the individual has lived with for the past six months. So this is kind of like a general framework. The court isn't bound to this. If there is another, if, if say um, person five on the list is, is better suited to be the guardian, the court will make that determination. And there are a couple of different um, avenues for becoming a guardian. So there's testamentary um, guardianship, and I'm not going to go over it too much because it it, um, it, it involves someone who's who already has a guardian, um, but the that individual who is the guardian um, wants to make sure that um, their their ward is taken care of should they lose capacity or should um, should they no longer be able to care for the individual. So it's, it can be done by will or other um, other signed writing. And it, it's generally used by parents um, with with adult children who 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 are guardians to care for um, to care for the individual. And then there is guardianship by petition, which is the one we all know about. And this is where an interested party petitions the court 
for guardianship and it depends on the county. Um, so you, you want to go to the county uh, where the individual who's subject to guardianship resides. Um, that individual has due process rights, which means that individual can contest the guardianship. They can offer their own evidence. They can ask for their own medical evaluations. Um, and, and they and they can um, they, they must be they must receive notice too that that guardianship is um, at play. So um, what all is involved? So the court generally uh, assigns an investigator who will interview all interested parties and will file a report with the court. Um, and uh, the court will also order a or request a medical examination of the individual. And the medical examination can be done by a doctor or a, a psychiatrist, psychologist, or a nurse practitioner. And all that information is given to the judge. The judge reviews it and will make determinations as to whether guardianship is appropriate. In the last um, one, court appointed. So, so um, private fiduciaries occurs generally occurs when there are multiple individuals who want to be the guardian. So think of um, parents who have children who who and those children all want to be guardian. Uh, and private fiduciaries are kind of like a compromise where like a, a private firm or individual will will act as a guardian. A public fiduciary is often called the guardian of last resort. So these are for your indigent um, individuals who who don't have the who don't have um, a lot of financial resources, and who don't have anyone else to care for them, or willing to be um, a guardian. So so this section is um, this this slide is about decision making on a spectrum. So if you're thinking about supported decision making and, and guardianship on a spectrum, um, at one end you have supported decision making where, where the individual will retain the right to make their own decisions. And my, my colleagues will go into this more uh, when, uh, when, when supported decision making is being discussed. But just to briefly discuss it, it, it's where an individual retains that right to make decisions. And then somewhere in the middle, you have limited guardianships. So limited guardianships are certain areas where the court has determined an individual does not have capacity um, to, to exercise uh, certain rights. So for example, I, I heard a story about a mother who went to the probate court to petition for limited guardianship on a very specific thing. And I, and I think that was healthcare for her daughter. And it was just about healthcare. So uh, she went through the processes and the court determined that the, the individual, the daughter needed a guardian in just healthcare decisions. So the court um, ordered uh, a limited guardianship in that case. So you can think of limited guardianship as, as, certain, as protections for individuals in very specific areas. And then uh, it's not included on, on the slide, but you can, uh, you can also include um, alternatives to guardianship uh, as well. So I, I can, I'm gonna go into this at the very end of the presentation, but alternatives to guardianship can include like powers of attorney, healthcare powers of attorneys, uh, uh, vocational rehabilitation um, representatives and, and things like that. And at the very end of the spectrum, um, there's plenary and full guardianship. So that's where all the rights of an, an, an individual are taken and given to someone else. And I'm gonna um, briefly talk about the uniform adult guardianship and protective proceedings Jurisdiction Act, or the UAGPPJA. So that's a super long name, and it's a very, very um, difficult acronym, but it was enacted by Arizona in 2010, and it was mainly designed, it's an act, a, a piece of legislation that was mainly designed to avoid any confusion as to um, what jurisdiction laws apply and, and avoid confusion and other things too. But you know, for this context, uh, when jurisdiction issues 
arise. So for example, you you have a you have like a, a, a child who or you have like an adult child who um, who was grant or ordered a guardian um, by a court in Arizona. Like what happens if that family moves to California? Would um, guardianship would that guardianship order apply or would that family still need to go through the same processes? And you can think of it. Um, within the tribal context as well. Um, where would um, uh, where would these proceedings initiate and where would these orders take effect? So to avoid confusion, um, Arizona enacted the law and, and it's a multi-state jurisdiction. I think there are only eight states um, who, who haven't adopted these laws, but it provides a simplified process for determining um, when adults are subject to guardianship and, and they move to a different state or jurisdiction. And here's a quote from Holland and Knight that I pulled that, that kind of um, involves this context. However, with some exceptions, a guardianship of the person who, for a tribal member who does not reside in an Indian or native community will likely require registration of guardianship order in the foreign jurisdiction in order to be meaningly enforceable. So, um, so guardianship is, I, I should have said this in the beginning, guardianship is a, a kind of, it can be potentially tricky, um, depending, because you're trying to determine where, what jurisdiction applies and, um, and what processes are all involved. So if you do have any questions, um, I definitely urge you to reach out to an attorney who practices in this area. And with that, I am going to turn it over to the next presenter. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Myers, Executive Director of the ARC of Arizona. Thanks very much, Sai, for providing us a, a little overview of what guardianship is. And I'm gonna take off from there and talk about what supported decision-making is. So next slide, please. We all know that life is full of choices. We make dozens or hundreds of choices every single day, whether we even know it or not. Some are conscious, some are unconscious. Some we make decisions about things like what to eat or, or, or what clothes to wear or what we have to do in a given day. But sometimes we aren't sure what kind of choice to make. Sometimes choices are very complex or sometimes choices puzzle us. And so we turn to people for help. Next slide, please. And when we ask people for help, when we turn to other people for input or guidance or suggestions or recommendations on the kinds of things we need to do or, 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 um, or say or, or eat or wear in a given day, that's what's called supported decision-making. That is getting support from someone else to help us in our decision-making processes. Next slide, please. It's something we all engage in. It's something every human being engages in when they interact with another person. For people with disabilities, making decisions uh, is a right that they should retain to the greatest degree possible. But sometimes making decisions can be a very challenging exercise for them, more challenging, especially if they have cognitive difficulties than it can be for people who don't have disabilities. So if that's the case, but if guardianship is not the appropriate option for them, if their needs are not so great that a guardianship is appropriate, supported decision-making may be the right option for them. Supported decision-making is, as a formal concept, is very important because it maintains the independence and autonomy of the individual and helps that person retain their rights to make decisions for themselves. But at the same time, it puts into place a team of individuals, of supporters, who help that individual by providing guidance and assistance about the key decision-making that they have to do in their lives, about the most important decisions they need to make, whether that's about healthcare or finances or education or employment or a whole host of other topics. It also <clears throat> creates a formal network of support as opposed to the more informal network that most of us rely upon on a daily basis. And the important thing about having that formal network is that under supported decision-making, 
And with supported decision-making agreements in place, and I'll talk about agreements a little bit later, these individuals with disabilities know that they will always have people they can turn to, that those people have agreed in a formal sense to act on their behalf and to assist them, but not to make decisions for them, simply to provide them the help they need to make decisions for themselves. Next slide, please. Now, these supporters that I mentioned, they come from a variety of different walks of life. They serve voluntarily. They're not paid. They're not compensated in any way for the work they do in supporting an individual with a disability, except in the knowledge and the satisfaction that they have helped that person become a better decision maker and they have helped that person make the best possible decisions for himself or herself. These people can include family members or friends or coworkers, people from church or, or your faith community, people from your recreation pursuits. They can be people who are legal advisors or healthcare advisors or healthcare professionals. Really, the range of walks of life they can come from is limitless. The point is, they serve on the team because they can fulfill a particular function, because they can offer a particular type of advice. Now, that doesn't mean that somebody who serves uh, as a support team member in order to offer financial advice has to be a, a certified financial planner. It simply means that that person has to have some competence in managing personal financial issues. It has to be good at balancing a checkbook, for example. It has to be able to provide sound advice about how money should be saved or how money should be invested. So people serve because they bring a certain type of knowledge or certain type of experience to the team. And they also sign an agreement that says they will act in the best interest of the individual with the disability. It means they will not act in their own self-interest as members of the support team. Next slide, please. So in a nutshell, Supported decision-making is really exactly what its name implies. It is an example of people with disabilities retaining their rights to make decisions for themselves, but having those supporters in place, having that network of supporters, that community of supporters in place to provide them the guidance they may need, to provide alternate perspectives, to help them really understand the key decision-making that they're doing. But fundamentally, and you'll hear us say this a, a number of times, and we apologize if we say it too much, but we feel like we can't say it too much. Fundamentally, it is about people with disabilities retaining the right to make their own decisions for themselves with support and guidance, but not having other people make those decisions for them. Next slide, please. So how do you decide if supported decision-making is right for you? Next slide. Well, remember, <clears throat> supported decision-making as a concept is about individuals with disabilities being able to make their own choices, but having the right type of support available to them to make the best possible choices. Next slide, please. Remember though that decision-making can be very complex. And going back to what Sai said, guardianship serves a very important function in our society. We are not here to say that guard guardianship should be abolished because in fact, supported decision-making is not the right choice for everybody. It may work very, very well for people who are capable of expressing and making and expressing their decisions. Next slide, please. But there are people who don't have the capacity, who don't have the capacity either to make decisions for themselves or to meaningfully express those decisions for themselves. Next slide. So what works for some might not work for others. And that means that before determining if supported decision-making is the right option, you need to ask a few questions. Supported decision-making, again, requires the capacity of individuals to communicate their wants and needs, to make decisions for themselves with assistance if necessary, but to be able to make those decisions and also to be able to grow and develop based upon the decisions they make. We all have to recognize we sometimes make mistakes. 
And supportive decision making doesn't do away with the mistakes that people make, but it does help people make the best possible decisions given particular circumstances. The important thing is that when a person does make a decision that kind of goes awry, that doesn't work out well for them, that person has to be able to learn from the mistake and grow from it, just as you and I grow from the mistakes that we have made since childhood and continue to make in our lives. If we're doing it right, we're learning and we're not repeating those mistakes the next time. Next slide, please. So a couple of questions that have to be asked based on the same things that were on that prior slide. Can the individual that we're talking about, the person with the disability, express his or her choices? If they're able to make choices, if they're able to determine what works best or what they want or what they need, can they then express it through some form, whether natural or assisted? What types of support is that a person going to need? Because for some people, the level of support they're going to need in order to make decisions is in itself kind of a deal breaker. It may not be practical. It may be at such a high level that the individual will require more than even a team of supporters can provide. However, if a team of supporters can reasonably provide the kind of input and guidance that individual needs, then supported decision-making may very well be the right choice. Finally, you have to determine how much support and how often that person is going to need support. Again, a team of individuals who act on this support team are volunteers. They're not paid. They're not likely to be able to give up every moment of their personal lives in order to serve on a support team. So the amount that's being asked of them has to be reasonable. And if it isn't reasonable, supported decision-making might not be the right choice. Next slide, please. Now, if you decide that it is the right choice for you or for someone that you love, someone who you give care for, remember always that planning is essential. Planning at the outset and planning throughout the process, which means planning throughout the life of the individual with the disability. Next slide, please. And the kinds of things that you need to think about, again, at the outset and throughout the person's life are widely varied. This list you see before you is not even the entire list. You do need to consider the financial status of that person and what finances are going to look like over the lifetime. You need to consider what services that person is receiving, whether from the state or from the tribal community. You need to understand what the healthcare needs are going to be over the long term because needs change. And this can be true in every one of these categories and many others. We always have to bear in mind that needs are going to change over time. We can't predict the future, but we certainly need to do our best to try and plan for it. So for housing, employment, education, transportation, all of these things and many more, consideration needs to be made of what, is, what the needs are now and what the needs are going to be over the long term. Next slide, please. You also need to bear in mind that this planning doesn't take place. Uh, the, the individual with the disability is not the only person who engages in it. Even that person and his or her family is not, are, are not alone in engaging in it. It takes, if you'll pardon an overused phrase, it takes a village. It takes a large number of people to provide their input on the planning process, much less the support team. So the person with the disability obviously needs to be at the center of this. It is very person-centered but it also needs to include other individuals who are important in that person's life. Going back to the kinds of people who might make up a support team, well, the same kinds of individuals could be involved in this planning process. They are people who are important, people who are close, people who have an important relationship, whether through work or, or church or other faith communities or, or through school or through social activities. Uh, again, could be financial advisors, healthcare providers, and so on and so forth. This, this list is not intended to be all inclusive. It could include many other people as well. Next slide, please. We suggest that you make um, a, a kind of a chart. It can be as simple as the one you see in front of you, which has a column for the areas of support a person may need and how that person would like to receive the report of the support. You can make it more complex if you want, but this is a pretty easy way of showing. In this case, we've thrown in finances medical and employment as the areas of support that a person has, and then in the right-hand column, how the person would like to receive the support. Next slide, please. You can make up your own just as simple as this, or you can make up something more complex. This version is available through the curriculum guide that we've put together, and it's available at the Southwest Institute for Families and Children website 
at swifamilies.org. Uh, there's a whole guide of, of, of resources. And this is, again, just a simplified version of what a chart may look like. But we suggest that you put that together because it's always better to have things down in writing rather than to have a, a large group of people trying to remember things uh, just in their heads. Next slide, please. I want to close by saying that uh, you know the planning process, as I said, is essential, and, and there are a few things that, that really need to be borne in mind when you are planning. I apologize if I'm repeating myself, but we think these things are important to emphasize first. And again, the person with the disability is the ultimate decision maker in a supported decision making arrangement. People are not making decisions for that person; he or she is making that decisions for themselves. Secondly, the supporters are there to provide support. They're not there to step in and not there to take over the process. Remember that the person with the disability has to have the ability to communicate their wants or needs. Again, it can be through natural means, it can be through assistive means, through assistive technology or some other means. But if that person can't communicate wants or needs, it's unlikely that supportive decision-making is going to be successful. Finally, as I said before, we have to remember that life is complex. Things change over time. There are a lot of things to consider in planning. There are a lot of things to consider through the process of supported decision making. And it's impossible for one person probably to be able to consider all those things. It takes a team. Remember that things are going to change over time. Try to anticipate change as best you can. We can't, again, predict, predict the future, but we can try to anticipate things. We can try to make accommodations for change that's going to take place over time. And make sure you give the planning process the time it needs. If you invest the time at the outset, the dividends will definitely pay off over the long term. So don't try to do it. You know, don't try to do it uh, in a short fashion. Don't try to give it too little time, or you may regret that. Give it the time it needs, and it definitely will work out better in the end. Next slide. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Juliana, who's going to talk to you about our next topic. Yeah, choosing the right support person. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Next slide. So choosing the right support person is important to having a successful support decision-making relationship. Supporters may be involved in some of the most personal aspects of that person's life and play an important role in making sure that people with disabilities are able to live an independent life. Supporters should also have some knowledge or the experience in the area they are asked to support. While it may be tempting to ask the best friend of the person with a disability or their support supporter if neither have experience in the area they are needing assistance, more harm will be done than good. For example, if the person with a disability were to choose someone to assist them in, in handling their banking matters, it would be ideal that they choose somebody who has experience in doing banking. That does not mean that they have to choose a certified financial planner, but they should choose somebody who has experience in going to the bank. Next slide. Um, and then if you want to click a little bit. One of the most important aspects of support decision making is providing clear and unbiased information. Supporters should not provide advice or support based on how it will benefit them. And this is clear violation of support decision making relationship. Supporters need to provide information in a manner that is clear and understandable to the person with the disability so that they are able to make decisions that they believe will benefit themselves. If the person with a disability believes that their supporter is providing biased information, the person has every right to try and correct the situation or end the agreement. Also, if other supporters sense that the supporter is providing biased information or taking advantage of the person with a disability, under the support decision-making agreement, they are now Court mandated reporters and must report any abuse they suspect. Next slide. In support decision making, it is up to the person with the disability to decide which areas of their life they will like to support and who they would like to support them. 
That means they can have multiple areas of support with multiple supporters, or maybe just one area of support with one supporter. It's up to the person with the disability to decide. With that said, having more than one supporter does have benefits. If the person with a disability has more than one area of support, having multiple supporters can help prevent supporters from feeling overwhelmed from the assistance they might need to provide. Another benefit of having multiple supporters is the prevention of abuse. Having multiple supporters means having multiple people making sure that the person with a disability is living a secure and independent life. As I was saying earlier, all supporters are court mandated reporters. If one supporter suspects there's abuse going on, they must report the abuse. Next slide. One of the benefits of having a support decision agreement is that they can be in charge or, or they can change or end at any time. Support decision making agreements do not require to be filed with the court or need a judge to approve the agreements. If the person with a disability or the supporter feel that the agreement needs to change or end, both can do so at any time. Changing or ending agreements is not necessarily a bad thing. Perhaps the supporter may no longer feel capable of providing the type of support the person with a disability needs, or perhaps the person with the disability no longer needs as much support as they initially needed at the beginning when they first started living independently. It is important to remember that supported decision-making agreements should reflect what the person with the disability needs at that moment. Next slide. Now let's talk about asking someone to be your supporter. Life. Asking someone to be your supporter is probably going to be one of the most important conversations had between the person with the disability and the supporter. It is important because the possible supporter is being asked to formally commit to provide the assistance needed for the person with the disability to live an uh, independent life. This is so important that it may take several conversations before anyone commits to doing anything. Remember, the possible supporter may not be familiar with support decision-making agreements and how they work. When having conversations about possible working together, be clear and upfront about what is expected from each other. You want to avoid any surprises that the possible supporter did not expect. Next slide. When having conversations about supportive decision-making, be clear and upfront about what is expected from each other. Explain the principles behind supportive decision-making and its purpose of ensuring that people with disabilities are able to live an independent life. Talk about the difference between supportive decision-making and guardianship. Explain to them that guardianship takes away the rights of people with disabilities and believe that is not needed for the person with a disability. If the possible supporter cannot agree to the basic principles of support decision-making, perhaps that is possible may not be a good match. Next slide. As stated earlier, it is important to be clear about the type of assistance needed. The person with a disability may need a lot of assistance or little but being upfront about what is needed, this will allow the possible supporter to decide if they are able to make the commitment needed to provide the support. Of course, things may change over time as the supporter and the person with the disability work together. Perhaps the person with the disability de develops the independence of the skills necessary to do things on their own without needing as much support. The best part of support decision-making is that they can always change. Next slide. When discussing support decision-making with a possible supporter, it is important that the supporter understands that the purpose of support decision-making 
is to help the person with a disability retain their rights and live independent lives. That means people with disabilities are responsible for the decisions that they make and supporters are only there to provide assistance. Next slide, and I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over back to John. Okay, we had a question in the chat that I wanna address really quickly before I go on. Uh, it says, so this is not someone performing representative payee or conservatorship duties. It's a formal advocacy position out of what office? Like a power of attorney? In fact, it's none of those things. And Sai will talk a little bit more about how those things can complement supported decision-making. But this is not a representative payee situation or a conservatorship situation. And it's not a power of attorney situation. Uh, it is a, a completely voluntary opportunity for individuals to act as support team members and for the individual with the disability to gather that team of volunteer supporters. Now, representative payees, powers of attorney, other third party uh, or advanced directives, third party arrangements, conservatorship, those all may play a role depending upon uh, the particular strengths or weaknesses of the individual with the disability but supported decision-making itself does not uh, inherently include any of those. And I'll leave it at that, and Sai can talk a little bit more about those uh, a little bit later. So I'm gonna talk about supported decision-making agreements, because once an individual with a disability has decided to engage in supported decision-making, it's really important that that person sign an agreement with each of the individuals who's agreed to be a supporter. And why is it important? Well, first of all, uh, remember that a supported decision-making agreement, and I will say this from the outset, is not a contract. It is not a legal contract. It is an agreement between two private parties. But what it does is it puts into writing the expectations that both parties have of one another, the individual with the disability and the supporter. It lays out their responsibilities toward one another, and it establishes parameters regarding what an individual supporter has access to see in the way of HIPAA protected information, education information that's protected by law, legal or financial information that's also protected by law. The agreement spells out exactly what the supporter is allowed to see and what the supporter is expected to do. It also spells out some of the other obligations of the supporter, and we'll talk about those as I go along. Furthermore, an agreement can let people who provide social services, whether that's somebody from DDD or from a tribal social service agency or a healthcare provider or an educator or a lawyer, it can let them know that the individual with the disability has support, has other people helping to explain information that might be complex and might be difficult for that person to understand, and also is there to help express that person's wishes and decisions once the information has been discussed. So it's, it's, a, it's a document that spells out for everybody, for every party involved, exactly what role supporters play and what the individual with the disability expects of those supporters. Next slide, please. This is very small and I apologize for that. It may be difficult to read on the screen, but I'm gonna go through section by section, but this is basically what a supported decision-making agreement entails. It's a relatively short document. Next slide, please. It has a couple of different sections. First of all, it includes the appointment of a supporter. And that basically means that the individual with the disability is naming who that supporter, individual supporter is going to be. And I wanna reiterate something that Juliana said, typically a team of supporters is just that. It's not an individual. It's a team of say three or five or 10, depending upon the needs of the person with the disability, the team can be whatever size is appropriate and whatever size is manageable. But there is an individual support agreement with each one of the individuals acting as a supporter. So in this case, the agreement starts by the person with the disability, including his or her name, stating that they're entering into this agreement uh, at, voluntarily, not under duress. They then add the information about the, the supporter, the contact information, and they list the kinds of things that that supporter is expected to provide the person with a disability uh, in doing in life or, or, or accessing in life. Now we've put a couple of examples here, but these agreements can be customized depending on the particular needs of the person with the disability. So food, clothing, shelter, taking care of physical health, 
financial affairs, those are just examples. It can certainly include a longer list and a more detailed list depending upon the individual's needs. Next slide, please. This section also includes helping to define what the individual supporter has a right to have access to. I mentioned legal or financial or educational or healthcare information. In this agreement, it needs to be explicitly mentioned what that, a pers what that person can see and what that person cannot see. And that's a protection for the person with the disability, but it's also a protection for the supporter. Next slide, please. You also need to put in the effective dates of the agreement. Now, this can be a defined time period. It can be an open-ended time period. There's no requirement that it have a start and end date. There is only a requirement that there be something here uh, and that, uh, that there be some acknowledgement that the agreement has been entered into on a particular date. Next slide, please. It also requires the signature of the person in, in, involved as a supporter. That person needs to acknowledge that he or she is consenting to take part in this agreement. Next slide. Finally, it requires that the individual with the disability and two witnesses sign a document themselves and that they do it in the presence of a notary, a notary public. If you're not familiar with that, that's a person who has a special license from a county or state to certify legal documents. And so this document needs to be signed by the person with the disability and those two witnesses and then notarized. The notary will, will sign it, place a stamp, date it, and basically that's it. Next slide, please. That makes this agreement effective. Now, as I said, the agreements can be customized based on the needs of the individual with the disability. So don't take this example as, as being etched in stone. It can, all be, uh, it can all be customized, but the legislation that we are proposing that is currently in the Arizona legislature and is just awaiting uh, a vote on the Senate floor to be transmitted to the governor for his signature, that legislation specifically says that at a minimum, there is certain information in this template that has to be included. It has to be in legalese, it has to be in substantially the same form as this, but it also needs to reflect the individual needs of the person with the disability. Remember, this agreement is important not because it's a contract, it is not a contract, it's an agreement, but it spells out in writing what's expected of both parties and what's allowed for both parties. It helps to protect the parties in the agreement if something seems to go astray. It helps to protect them from, from legal issues. It also lets other people know what is, what, what is actually taking place in this arrangement. It lets doctors and lawyers and educators and healthcare providers and other social service providers know that there is in fact support for the person with the disability so that he or she has input and guidance about the important decisions that person needs to make. And as Juliana mentioned, these agreements can be terminated or modified at any time. I go back to what I said before about planning. Things change over time. Certain people on a support team may not be needed at a certain point in time, or they may wish to go their separate ways. They may move out of town. They may take on a different job and not have time to do it anymore. Whatever the case, support team agreements can change over time, or they can be, um, they can be terminated at the, wish, at the wish of either a supporter or the individual with the disability. So you're not locked into something that's not working or that is no longer necessary after its useful life. Next slide, please. And now I'll turn it back over to Juliana to talk about self-advocacy. Self-advocacy and support decision-making. Next slide. So what is self-advocacy? Self-advocacy is the ability to speak up for oneself and communicate wants and needs. Self-advocates are the decision-makers of their lives and should have that opportunity to do so. It is important to encourage and continue use of developing self-advocacy skills throughout a person's life. Next slide. The most important th thing to do is to let the person with a disability make their own decisions and the purpose of support decision making is to maintain independence. Unless a supporter is given certain rights, supporters are there just to help the person understand their choices. As this life, things may not always go well, but failure should not always be the reason to take away a person's rights. Next slide. So encourage the person with a disability to ask questions. And this is where supporters are needed 
help encourage people with disabilities to ask questions about decisions that will affect their lives. The person with a disability may not always be familiar with the topics or issues they have to deal with in their lives and supporters can help them and discuss about the pros and cons about possible options. Anyone can have a hard time deciding what's best for them and this can be overwhelming or discouraging, especially for a person with a disability. A supporter can encourage the person to ask questions until they feel comfortable making those decisions. Next slide. There are many ways to support a person with a disability. Some examples include using plain language. This means that the information is at about a grade level of fourth grade, where people can understand the information in simple terms. Avoid using large words. However, sometimes you need to use the words that are part of programs in the government system and agencies. But it can be described for people with disabilities so that they can understand. Define technical terms and explain what it means. And then finally, break down information and tasks to easy to understand steps. Sometimes taking time to understand the process may take a person with a disability time to digest what it is all about. And now I'm going to turn it over to Sai to finish this off. You're muted, Sai. Oh, sorry. I, I, I think we only have a few minutes left. So I, I think it oh I think it might be better just to um to go over the questions and I can direct you to um to a, a video that discusses this last section. So I'll just I'll go over I'll start reading the questions now. Um, so, so before I, I, I start reading the questions, I want to go. Um, I want to go back to something John said um, um, about complements and alternatives. I, I was going to talk about the Rep PE program and then conservatorship powers of attorneys. So, with power of attorneys and with healthcare power of attorneys, um, you, you you're essentially assigning an agent who is making decisions for you. And that's different from supported decision making because in supported decision making, the individual is the decision maker, and the individual has um, has has control and has autonomy. Um, so so that that could be a difference. But supported uh, but rep payee and conservatorships and um, powers of attorneys could be seen as complements or could see also be seen as alternatives. Um, instead of going the full guardianship route. So I'm just, I'm gonna um, try to read these questions real quick. So one question is, would someone in a supported decision-making agreement be held responsible to do something if a decision that person with a disability it's making will put them in danger of hurting themselves or others. So John, did you want what did you want to tackle this one? I'm happy to do I'll it. give it my best shot. Okay. The answer is no. Uh, the, 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 the point of supported decision making, and we I often say this, it rests on three pillars. One is self-determination, the other is the presumed competence. And the third is the dignity of risk. We all have, and the third one is the one I want to address now, we all have the opportunity to take chances in our lives every single day. And sometimes we make good decisions and sometimes we make bad decisions. Sometimes we actually make decisions that can hurt ourselves or others. The same is true of a person in a, support, in a supported decision-making relationship. Remember, these are people who are their own guardians. These are people who are not under um, the guardianship of someone else. They have just as much right to make decisions, good or ill, as any of the rest of us. And it is not the responsibility of a support team member to counteract a decision that somebody with a disability in a supported decision-making arrangement is making. They may make a very poor decision, but also the supporter is not gonna be held liable for that. The supporter is there to provide guidance and as so long as that person is living up to the terms of the agreement, they're not gonna be held liable for the decision that the person with the disability makes, regardless of whether it go 